Um, David Ashman is a book conservator and preservation manager, and he's going to talk about the long and, I suppose you could say, bumpy uh, journey that began in 2016, um, which completed in 2022. Um, David is currently the preservation manager at the Auckland Libraries, and he's also the founder and principal conservator of Book Studio. Um, and he's worked in the printing, paper, and conservation sectors for over 35 years. So a couple of things about the admin of tonight. If you wish to ask a question on, on the topics on the way through, we actually ask if you want to present it to David in the chat facility. Um, also, there will be a chance to do a Q&A directly with David um, at the end and after David has responded to the original chat questions. And at that stage, we'll bring it open and you can take yourself off on mute. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming along this evening to hear me talk about the treatment for Auckland Library's copy of the Shakespeare First Folio. Before we get into the conservation treatment, I'd just like to say a few words about the First Folio and why it's considered to be such an important book. A folio results from folding the printed sheet of paper just once to yield two leaves and four pages. Previously, some of Shakespeare's plays had been published individually in quarto where a sheet of paper is folded twice to produce four leaves and therefore eight pages, resulting in a smaller sized book. The first folio contains 36 Shakespeare plays, 18 of which had never been published before. It was the first published collection of Shakespeare's plays. It was put together by his fellow actors, John Heminge and Henry Condell, seven years after Shakespeare's death. Plays published here for the first time included Macbeth, The Taming of the Shrew, Antony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, The Tempest, Twelfth Night, Julius Caesar, and As You Like It. Of the estimated 750 copies printed, around 235 copies still exist. Of these, 82 copies reside in the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. The copy held by Auckland Libraries is one of only three in the Southern Hemisphere, the others being in South Africa and the State Library of New South Wales in Australia. Auckland Libraries' copy was donated by Sir George Grey, the 19th century Governor of New Zealand, who it, gifted his significant collection to the City of Auckland in the 1880s. Along with the Auckland Library's copy are several related documents, including the correspondence that was exchanged between the bookseller in London and Sir George Grey. In this 1892 letter from Sir George, he is inquiring about a copy of the folio in the bookseller's catalogue, priced £85. Here we jump forward to 1894, where Sir George has written to the British Museum to make sure the copy he is considering to buy is authentic and value for money. The reply is that £80 would not be an unreasonable price. In this letter, Bernard Quaritch, the bookseller, writes to Sir George to inform him he had bought a copy at auction that he'd liked so much that he'd paid the advanced sum of £255. Sir George could have this one for a nominal deposit, or he could offer another copy in not such good condition for £85. He went for the £85 copy, and as can be seen in this letter from Quaritch, it was unable to be repaired prior to arriving in New Zealand, as the only man in London able to do this work was seriously ill. In 2016, what became apparent was that due to heavy customer demand and exhibition use, our copy of the first folio was deteriorating more rapidly than might otherwise be expected. In part, this was due to library customers requesting to see and handle the volume that was due to publicity generated by the Pop-Up Globe 
and a very large decal on the ground floor window. The condition of the folio pre-treatment can be seen in the following few slides. The, the binding, probably dating from around the first half of the 19th century, is a full calf binding with decorative tooling on the spine and simple tooled panel on the front and back boards. It has had a reback that was likely done in the early to mid 20th century. In this slide, you see that the boards are badly scuffed and the leather has weakened along the joints and the corners are damaged. And here, the leather is lifting where the reback has been inserted and have split along the inner joints, revealing no cord attachment from the text block to the boards, probably due to weakening over time and being cut during the previous reback. This iconic engraved portrait by Martin Druschaut appears at the front of the book and is in very good condition, though it is a facsimile probably inserted at the time it was bound in the 19th century. The pages at the front and back were in the worst condition with fragile edges, losses and previous quite heavy handed repairs. And whilst the bulk of the text block was in good condition, there were around 20 pages dispersed throughout with tears and or losses. Before beginning any treatment, I conducted further research and consulted with book conservators in the UK and New Zealand, resulting in many hours of discussion. Having considered a range of options, I propose the treatment that will be shown in this presentation. When considering a conservation treatment for a book of this importance and historic value, it is essential to have a good rationale before interfering with it. With that in mind and contemplating the future use and current condition, I considered that the badly damaged pages at front and back were susceptible to further damage due to their fragility. Also, the previous binding and subsequent rebacking has resulted in a tight opening, causing the pages to distort and buckle and resulting in a restricted angle of view. Another decision was whether to retain its existing early 19th century binding or go for something contemporary to the period it had been published or something that was more modern but offered a better conservation outcome. There are precedents for the latter approach, as can be seen with the 12th century Doomsday Book, kept at the National Archives in the UK. In 1986, for the survey's ninth centenary, Great Doomsday was divided into two physical volumes and Little Doomsday into three volumes. However, for this project, the decision was made to retain the 19th century binding as it is part of the book's history and how it was presented by Sir George Grey to Auckland Libraries. I also made the decision to retain as much of the material that couldn't be put back as possible and leave any previous editions as is. This is all part of the book's history and may provide valuable information to future researchers. At the beginning of 2019, I was ready to present my report and treatment proposal to Georgia Prince, the former Rare Books librarian. This included dry cleaning the gutters, removing original spine linings and adhesives, repairing damaged pages, strengthening board attachment and a leather reback. This approach would ensure the damaged, damaged pages were less vulnerable to further damage and I surmised that by removing the spine, spine linings and glues and rebacking would ease the tightness of the opening and thereby reduce any cockling and distortion in the gutter. Once the treatment proposal had been agreed and signed off, I was able to start the conservation work around mid 2019. The first task was to dry clean by sweeping over 900 pages and gutters with a soft brush. After completing the initial cleaning and having flagged pages where there were tears, damage and other interesting features that I would return to later, and just as everything was getting underway in the middle of 2019, everything came to a crashing halt. 
Initially, this was due to personal health issues that started in mid-2019 and carried through to March 2020, when the first of several COVID lockdowns occurred. Eventually, there appeared to be some stability and we were able to return to the office. However, the building works to replace the roof at the Central Library were now underway and we were re required to evacuate the top floor, which is where the Conservation Laboratory is located. This carried through to early 2022 and just as I got ready to pick up where I'd left off with the conservation treatment of the folio, I was struck with more health issues that whilst not life threatening this time were certainly life disrupting. I was beginning to think I was destined to never complete the work I'd begun back in 2016. However, I was finally able to get back to it in September 2020. Two. 2022 with a goal to complete by that Christmas and my first task was to yet again go through all 900 odd pages giving it a second sweep to remove any leftover debris and mark any pages I'd missed the first time through that might be of interest for further investigation. Next was the scary part making that first intervention that marked a point of no return in terms of interfering with the makeup and structure of the binding. Firstly, removing the original spine that was attached to the rebacked leather and then scraping away with a knife the first layers of leather before applying a wheat starch poultice to soften the remaining linings and adhesives and carefully scraping off. All the material removed is retained and will be kept with the book for future study. And we can see in these images the leather, thick paper linings and a heavy application of glue that was all contributing to the restrictive angle of opening and tight binding. Here is one example of the removed adhesive to be retained for future research. And here we see a mostly clean spine with just a small residue of animal glue, mostly between the sections, that would be impossible to remove without completely disbinding. With the boards and spine removed, the next step was to repair the damaged pages. As there was no need to remove the sewing and take the book apart, the paper repairs were all undertaken in situ. This is by no means the worst damage that appeared in the book, but it is a good example of the kinds of repair that were common throughout. The area of loss is filled by using a Barcham Green handmade paper that matches in terms of weight and character. On an historic book such as this, it is always preferable to be able to distinguish between what is original and what has been added. To that end, there has been no attempt by me to blend in the paper repair more than to ensure it is sympathetic to the original and doesn't leap off the page. By the way, Barcham Green papers were made at Hale Mill in the UK from 1812 until they closed in 1987. Their wonderful handmade papers have been used by printers, artists and conservators for many years. I was fortunate to be able to visit the mill whilst it was still operating in 1984. This damaged and fragile edge has been reinforced using a very fine Japanese tissue of around six square uh, six grams per square meter and applied with wheat starch paste. This issue cropped up in a few places. As you can see with a light behind it there are dark areas. This is where the page has been folded in on itself and then during the binding process probably during the 19th century rebinding the edges have been trimmed with the corner folded in. This means that it, if it is unfurled to repair, the untrimmed part will stick out from the edge of the text block. This would not be desirable as it would be vulnerable to being damaged again. So instead, I have left it as is and, implied, uh, and applied a lightweight Japanese tissue to reinforce. 
As much as possible, and in keeping with conservation ethics, this and all treatment procedures will be reversible if necessary. Once all the paper repairs had been completed, it offered an opportunity to undertake digitization. Here is Joseph Brown, who is the digitization expert for Auckland Libraries. He is highly regarded in the field of photography and digitization here in New Zealand. And this was the best time in the history of Auckland Library's first folio to perform a digital capture, both in terms of the advancement of technology and that the book was now in a state that meant it could be opened at a wide enough angle to be able to capture right into the gutter. The images are now available uh, online through Auckland Library's Kura website. A search on Google for Kura Shakespeare should yield results. I was now ready to put the pieces back together and first up was to apply a Japanese tissue lining with wheat starch paste. This was used rather than the traditional animal glue as it has potentially longer lasting properties and is less likely to break down over time. There were no existing end bands on the book, although there would certainly have been when it was bound in the early 19th century. It is highly likely they were lost and not, not replaced during the more recent reback. I decided to go ahead and replicate with something close to what I thought would have been on that earlier binding. I chose the colours based on what I would consider to be historically accurate and made up a core using an archival quality handmade paper. I was first shown this style of end band during a vellum binding workshop with expert English bookbinder James Brockman. It is different from typical end bands of this type that have a bead running along the top of the band. This one also has a bead along the back, affording it extra strength in this area. The next lining also applied using wheat starch paste and a Hewitts of Edinburgh archival calf leather. This was ready to even out any lumps and bumps and so sanded down until smooth, almost back to the first lining. Next, I've added an Oxford hollow to allow for a more flexible spine movement, rather than having the leather reback and original leather spine applied directly to the back as it had been previously. Reback leather was the same leather from Hewitt's as used for the second spine lining. And for all you bookbinders out there, this will be very familiar. Here is a speeded up demonstration of leather pairing. I tend to favour the English pairing knife for working the edges of the leather. And then with a French pairing knife for the beveling. The leather was dyed to match as near as possible, though with the colours varying quite a lot on the spine and boards, it was never going to be an even match. And as previously mentioned, as long as the new piece is sympathetic to the original, it is desirable to be able to distinguish between the new and old. The dyes I am using here are from the Leather Conservation Centre in New Zealand and called Celeset dyes. Here is where I put on the leather reback, an operation that for me is always accompanied by a mild level of anxiety as it needs to be completed within a relatively short period of time. It's best done in one go and there is no easy way back. It involves applying the leather to the spine using wheat starch paste and then forming the caps at head and tail. And so I started the camera to film myself in some detail as I carefully shaped the caps by working them with my bone folders and ensuring I was in view, moving towards the camera lens for close-up shots. And when all was finished, I moved slowly out of view to leave the now rebacked spine lingering in shot, only to find I failed to click the start button to film the sequence. So instead, 
Here is a picture of the formed head cap. And now with the reback leather in place and the boards attached along the side with the new leather, I was able to move on to the inner joints. In this video, I'm speed pasting the overhang from the Japanese tissue first lining to reinforce along the joint. and then applying a strip of Dutch marble paper that blends in nicely to the original. As can be seen here, though on close examination, it is easy to distinguish the addition from the original. At this stage, I was able to replace the original spine. To prepare, I'd chamfered the edges and scraped off the previous reback leather using a knife complete and ready for an application of SC6000 acrylic leather wax, seen here being applied at speed. This product, like the leather dyes mentioned earlier, is from the Leather Conservation Centre in the UK and provides some protection during handling. And here you can see the finished book with new inner joints, paper repairs, rebacked spine and previously um, decorated spine reattached. This clip shows the box that I made to house the folio inside its previously made box along with all the extra supporting material and parts of the binding that were left over. Underneath the book are folders that have the related documents and conservation treatment reports. In the compartment below that is all the leftover materials, the dust and dirt, spine linings and glue. And I've also included samples of the brush hairs from the brushes used when sweeping the pages. For handling, I use these paper fingers to be able to carefully lift and turn the delicate documents. And this image just shows the Shakespeare first folio completed and being put into. I'd like to share with you a few discoveries I made during the course of treatment. During the sweeping process, all kinds of things appeared. And whilst I haven't had time to study the debris in great detail, I did see food crumbs, dead insects, and insect frass and hairs. In this picture, if you look very closely, you can see a hair just here that is held in tightly between the sections and is likely to have been introduced during the 19th century binding. Maybe it belonged to the book binding. In this image, a previous repair, I guess from the late 18th, early 19th century, has been repaired using linen sewing thread. You can see it along here and if I go in a bit closer you can see here there were a number of previous repairs especially at the front and back that were quite clumsy but I chose to retain them as is rather than undo and carry out neater repairs on this page we can see another rather heavy-handed repair where the original torn sheet has been laminated to a whole new page. And when we turn the page and transmit light through, it shows this signature. And if we have a look here, it's clearly showing a signature that previously hadn't been seen. So this is a new discovery. If you cast your minds back to the slide where I talked about sewing the end bands and how they were missing from the book as it had been before I started the conservation treatment and that I'd chosen the colours based on what I thought would be appropriate to the period of binding. 
After I selected the colours, I placed flags in each section so that it would mark where I was going to put the tie downs. Whilst doing this, I came across this. The exact colours that I'd already chosen for the, rep for the replica end bands. That was a very exciting find, if a little surprising that I'd missed it on my previous two sweep throughs. I managed to finish the bulk of the treatment just before Christmas and was able to return the folio back to its secure storage with the other Tanga that is looked after and cared for by Auckland Library's heritage staff. I feel extremely privileged to have had the opportunity to work on such an iconic book and feel proud of the work I've done to help it uh, help make it more accessible both now and for future generations. From a legacy perspective, this is a book that I will forever be connected with for as long as it exists. Researchers and conservators will know that I conserved this copy of the first folio. They will read my reports, scrutinise the repairs, study the bits and pieces preserved from past bindings and repairs, and either praise or curse me for the decisions I've made and the work carried out. Some of the lessons I've learned or that I've that have been reinforced during the course of the treatment are, take time to gather, digest, and contemplate all the information and options, because the first idea is not always the best. And a quote from Shakespeare himself, which is kind of counter to the previous lesson, striving to better, oft we mar what's well. And to finish off, an oldie but a goodie, if you want to give God a laugh, tell him your plans. And at the end, at the end of this presentation, you'll find a questions and answers uh, slide or two. And they were from questions that, that were asked at the end of this presentation and also some that arrived uh, by email subsequently. So after nearly 15 and a half years as preservation manager at Auckland Libraries, I am leaving at the end of April 2023 and will continue to work in the cultural conservation sector in my business, Book Studio One. That's the end of my presentation. Shall I stop sharing now, Chris? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's been great. Um, I, I just want to say um, just to David, um, thanks. Um, um, we've got to know David over many years with the ABC, and in particular, um, we've we've had the the I suppose the pleasure of being able to use the Auckland City Council Preservation Lab for a number of training courses throughout New Zealand here, and it's been a, a, as a direct response to actually having David on board and being able to have someone like that that understands the technology and wants to and is enthusiastic about it. I love your presentation about it. it. In fact, it sort of reminds me, I think I've got a book, which I think last time you dropped in, I said, I'm in the process of doing that. And I've stopped it for a year. And I, I'm now thinking, I now know what to do to finish it off. And um, in that case, and what I will do is we'll call 7.30 to finish. And thank okay. you for those that attended live, in particular to David, who's you know set up the presentation um, has spent a number of years on this particular project and presented it well and uh, and with a bit of humour. I do remember the times actually, uh, David, when you were in hospital and you had a bit of a, you know, um, a bad, a bad, I suppose you could say, you know, uh, times and that, but you've obviously survived exceptionally well and now <laughs> it's time to retire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> sort of. Well, <laughs> Retire, but do things for yourself. How's that? Mm -hmm. right. Oh, nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thanks Bye. again, David. Bye. Cheers. Bye.